Right, hello everyone. Hi Josephine. All right, hi uh Yu Jong. All right, hi Yu Jong. Long time no see. Hi Josephine, hi Yu Jong. Uh, let's just give it a while as we wait for the other viewers to actually slowly stream yep. in. Hi, I see. We won't be waiting for too long because I will start off uh, a couple of minutes once I'm set up. Okay, we try to keep to the time schedule. So, uh, you know, we, we respect everybody's time as well. It is the weekend after all. Okay, we yes. want to add values, right? We want to add values, but, uh, you know, let's try to make sure everybody have their weekends at the same time. Aha, uh -huh. yeah. same, same, same issues, right? But it's, all right, it's normal because we have new uh, members in the public group coming in each and every week. So uh, someone is Facebook user right now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right now. So if you're, the, if you're joining us for the Facebook live stream uh, for the first time this week uh, via our public group options for cash flow, can you click on the streamyard.com slash Facebook link? in the post itself okay and then uh just approve facebook approve stream yeah on facebook so we'll be able to see your name when you leave a comment yeah all right now thank you very much hi ft hi jason welcome back jason hello jason hello ft all right uh, terence how was your week for your treats uh was it fruitful for you uh not too bad it's uh you know we just have to be a bit picky but i do think that uh, recently combining a little bit of simple simple market uh, indicator timing when they are aligned uh, shows a lot more, how do we say this, a lot more comfort um, when you're selling. Yeah, because uh, you know you, you know the fact that market wants to sell off, uh, but you are also not into stocks that are already severely overbought. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, looking at charts is always about a matter of probabilities where you're trying to depend on uh, what has happened in the past, past behaviors, and you're trying to project it forward. And, you know, it's it's always a little bit self-fulfilling because uh, everybody is looking at it. You know, there, there's so many people who look at the market and, you know, even the Robin Hood traders, what they're doing is they're probably going to search on Google, pick up some quick indicator tips. And then, you know, once they see those things happening on the in indicators, right, they may be trying to follow it at the same time. Now, so, uh, you know, the more people see, the more people kind of uh, would utilize it. So that's why ultimately somehow technical indicators at certain point of time tends to become self-fulfilling by itself. Now, so, you know, with the markets being so stretched and showing that signs of cracks over here, right? It will make a lot of sense to get into, uh, how do we say this? Get into stocks that are not severely overbought because if you do so, right? they are probably going to be hit harder uh, when it comes to the market. Yeah, okay. Now, so that's uh, basically the, the take over here. But uh, whatever stocks that we did inside this week or we sold options on this week has been uh, relatively fine. And I think in our session last night, uh, the free, uh, or we call it portfolio building in Terrence, I actually closed up some trades as well. Uh, so I think it's not too bad. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, at, at the end of the day, when you look at the market, you always have to pick up the best uh, deals. And at times, at times, no matter how big your account is, you need to understand that even some of the best fund managers out there, right? They don't they don't go into a stock every day. There are days where they're managing billions of dollars, right? But they just refuse to take on a trade because there is just nothing. Yeah, all right. No, sometimes it even stretch for a couple of days. Sometimes it stretch for over a week, right? But if there's nothing, then there's nothing. Right? Because if you try to find something out of nothing, then it's usually of no quality at all. Or yeah. not the quality that you want. You know what I mean? Yeah? Okay. All right. Now, so let's get going. Okay. Okay. All right, now, then. Now, so a uh, little small talk over there while we wait for more people to join us. Now, so if you're officially with us, uh, can you help us click on the like and share buttons? Or actually, not so much like, but more of the share buttons. Okay, uh, to help us share out the videos where we can reach out to as many people as possible. Okay, and it's always with my segment right now. Okay, because I will start off this weekend sessions right now with a market overview, market summary. And then after that, we'll let uh, Jeremy go into his fundamental analysis on the stocks that we're picking up today. Yeah, All right now. So let me share my screen. Let me get it on. All right. 
Okay, now, so welcome everyone. Welcome to the weekly weekend summary of what the markets are doing or what the market will do uh, or can possibly do by next week. Now, so what we have over here on my chart, it's a simple Bollinger Band setup, which is a kind of volatility indicator that you can see uh, right at the top. Okay, and then a simple RSI below, which measures the strength of the current movements in the market. And then an oscillator, uh, which is slow stochastics, which I'm looking for overbought, oversight, uh, oversold signals. And of course, an MACD over there, which shows uh, also a kind of market momentum and market strength. Now, just some simple setup, nothing too, com not, nothing too fancy, nothing too complicated. You're not going to see your 50%, 61.8% kind of Fibonacci stuff. No, that's not me. <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay, now I'm just trying to keep it simple because uh, it's a matter of getting perspectives. Now, so uh, whether you like it or not, whether you like it or not, when you trade stocks, there is always what we call an ebb and flow. Okay, ebb and flow, meaning up and then down, up and then down. It's, uh, I, I think a simple way for common investors to understand is like a rubber band. You know, you try to pull a rubber band and then after that, you have to let it go before you make the next pull and then you let it go, it makes the next pull kind of thing. All right, so it's like a pull and push, pull and push in the market. Now, so whenever markets make a pull and push, right, whether you see or you don't see it, what it tends to do, okay, is actually this. You would actually see that it ends up boxing itself, okay? Now, so you see that uh, S&P is in this box over here for quite a while back here, right? For many, many weeks. Yes, we have a break over here, but then after that, it goes back up and then it starts moving into this box again, okay? And then recently, we had a breakout, uh, you know, after the COVID recovery, we had a breakout move uh, sometime in October. Uh, that's last year, all right? That's last year, we had the October move. All right, and then it moved up to the top of the box over here before the COVID market collapsed. Sorry, I got my timeline a bit off. I forgot I'm looking at the weekly charts. Um, now, so the COVID market crash brought it, of course, way out of the box. Okay, now, and then after that, we slowly climbed back. Okay, we climbed back into the first box, of course, that was broken. Right, and then after that, subsequently back into the October box. Okay, now, so you can see that we are now still back inside this box itself because we had a false break. Right, where we had one week up and then the next week was the sell-off. Yeah, okay, All right now, and we are back into the this box frame over here. Now, so much like last week, I could say that if we go down, all right, if we go down, there'll be two targets that we can see if selling resumes next week. One will be the 50-week moving average, which is at 3,100 and 3120. All right, it's at 3120, all right, and then we have the uh bottom of the box which is at three zero two zero all right three one two zero three one two zero all right and three zero two zero okay now and that literally means we could possibly see well over 200 percent uh no not 200 percent 200 points drop in the market uh ahead of us in the following week okay now so still do exercise caution because those of you who are aware of indicators what you see over here is a divergence Right now, and divergence shows that while market is making new higher prices, all right, it lacks the momentum uh, that causes it to charge up the last time around to a new high. So that means this new high is made on what we call weaker players, weaker strengths. Okay, and something that's more concerning right now is also this. Uh, if you can see uh, right at the bottom over here, I seem to always have difficulties when it comes to drawing. Yeah, there we go. Okay, now if you see at the bottom over here, all it takes is one more week of selling, one more week of a red bar or red candle over here, and we will have the cut, right? And once we have the cut, which means the momentum or the MACD starts to get red on the histogram, all right, it may start to bring in more sellers over here. Yeah, right now. So that's one concern that I have. The other concern that I have, of course, is, you know, when, when we break it down, when we break it down to the weekly, uh, sorry, daily charts over here, now, what's concerning here is now this, okay? When we go into the uh, daily charts, all right, you can clearly see that uh, the S&P 500 has actually broken, right? It has actually broken the 50-day moving average, right? And that is actually, uh, you know, a little bit bearish on the chart side, okay? It's broken down below the 50-day moving average. And the next concern is also this. Can you see that we have a rebound, all right? Now, the rebound is possibly because we hit the bottom of the Bollinger Band, but even after Friday's rally, right? Okay, we are still below the 50-day moving average. Yeah, so that's gonna be a concern because uh, 
for the bullish trend to resume or you know any sustained buying to resume all right we need to see break back above okay we need to see break back above because now that is below right it shows that the sellers have the upper hand right the sellers are in the driving seat so that's why you know like i mentioned we need to include more uh kind of indicators to make sure that whatever options that we're selling all right we are doing so in the right direction and in the right environment otherwise you know we are, we are basically detrimenting ourselves uh, for example, you know, in my portfolio building return segments on Fridays now, okay, it's Fridays, uh, 9.30 p.m. Okay, now, if I were to, uh, for example, let me pick a stock over here. Uh, what would be a great stock? Let's take Apple. Okay, in no reference, uh, I, I, I'm, you know, kind of uh, trying to insinuate a trade, but let's just say this. Let's say, let's say that, you know, we have the market correction, but we have Apple that is somewhere here. Okay, Apple that is somewhere here. Okay, where my cursor is. Okay, uh, let me let me let me be very sure and very clear. Okay, all right, I'll just draw it. Oh man, okay, I'm referring to this red candle over here. Now, so imagine that you had the market sell off to where we are right now. And then you're looking for a put option to sell, for example, portfolio or non-portfolio. Yeah, all right. Whether you are leverage or not leverage, let's just say you're selling a put option. Now, uh, this is definitely a no-go, right? No matter how cheap it is, all right. This is definitely a no-go. Why? Because imagine that we said that the uh, bears have the upper hand, huh? which means the sellers have the upper hand, all right. And then if you do so, all right, even if you kind of bottom pick, that means uh, even if you sell a strike that is much lower, for example. Okay, let's say you position yourself somewhere here, okay, where we have, let's say, 115 strike. So you have Apple right here now uh, at 120, okay, 120. And it has fallen from 138 to 120 in just two days, right, Jeremy? That's quite a, yep. severe, that's quite a severe draw, right? You can admit that, okay? Now, and then you, you try to become a bargain hunter. You feel that, oh, you know, it's overdone. It's overdone. I think Apple will rebound. Yeah, okay, now I'm just trying to put some light onto why you need to check some other stuff. Okay, because even if you pick out 115 strike and you'll be going, oh my goodness, you know, I'm challenging Apple right now, which is which has fallen from 138 down to 120, 120, right? Okay, and I'm giving it another five dollars out of the money, right? So you it may lead you to think that you're actually safe. Because from 138 to 115, which is your strike, right? Okay, it's quite it's quite it's quite crazy actually it's like a 20 more than a 20 20 dollar drop all right and you know all this happening in one week right it's quite hard to imagine right with apple with such momentum right but uh, what i'm just saying is it's a bad time because if you look at this right the rsi has just uh come came back down from the overbought level okay and it's not fully cycled all right now cycling basically means that whatever goes all the way up has to come all the way down so for the RSI, whatever that went all the way up from 30 to 70, all right, has to come all the way back down to 30, right? That's always a possibility that you must understand, right? Just like if you live on the 10th story, you're going to take the lift all the way to the 10th story, right? But, you know, sooner or later or not, when you leave home again for another reason, you're going to take the lift from the 10th story all the way down to the first story, right? It's just a natural, you know, uh, thing that happens. Now, so if Apple does that, that means it's pointing to us that there's a lot more room to fall. Right? So that's why I will not pick out a situation like that. And, you know, it's not only the RSI. It combines together with stochastics, which also just cut, right? And it's nowhere near the bottom of it. Okay, and then looking at it, right, you can also see that the MACD itself turned red. So, you know, why are you trying to jump the gun or why are you trying to shoot the gun when the bears have control? You know what I mean? It's because you got to think of right now, right, especially when the bears have control of the market. Huh? you got to think like your gun, right? has only one bullet it has only one bullet so when you fire the gun right you better make sure you hit the target right you don't want to fire the gun right on the very first person you see or in this case the first stock that you see on your charts right and then after that realizing that there's so many more people behind it you know you, you're 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 causing a disadvantage to yourself okay now so this this is one of the reasons why you know i i'm trying to say that during this period when the markets are, make, are making it a little bit more challenging for option sellers, there are still ways. There are still many ways to find very decent trades right now. Okay, just for example, 
All right, I highlight I highlighted this trade, you know, sometime last week. All right, and I'm sure I'm I'm sure I think I covered it in last week's uh, session together with you as well. Now that is, you know, we had Kroger as well on a sell off. All right, and at this point, when they you know didn't perform as well on earnings, we had this sell off dip over here. And we had some community members who were asking, you know, Terrence, is this the time to sell, you know, a put option on Kroger? So that's where I said, no, not yet, not yet. Okay, so we waited and we waited, all right? And then when we had this over here, where Kroger, you know, closed back inside of the Bollinger Band again, all right? Now, this was the day where we actually went out there and sell, you know, a put option, all right? We, we took out a long trade or what we call a put option trade on Kroger. So yes, while it's still below its 50-day moving average, while the bears have control, right, but the bears have exhausted themselves, right? So we can come in over here as option sellers, right, to take advantage of the exhaustion. Because one thing good about option sellers is we don't have to be right. That means I don't need the stock to go flying all the way back high, right? I just need to make sure that the stock doesn't come crashing down. Yeah, right? So, you know, lining things up, all right, it's not, it's not like rocket science. It's just you know, what's, what's to my favor? Okay, I'm going to stack it up. I'm going to stack it up. I'm going to stack it up. But I need to make sure that at the same time, I'm not overstacking. Because if I'm overstacking, then it makes it, you know, a little bit too, uh, oh my God, Terrence, this is too difficult. It's like over the top of my head. No. Yeah? Okay? Now, so uh, I just mentioned the dangers of the SPY just now being uh, below the 50-day moving average. And you have heard me say this as well, which is always to compare the Apple. Okay, so Apple right now, it's a little bit on the balancing beam, all right? I say on the balancing beam because we had it moving below, right? We can see over here in the sell-off, it went below, it tried to challenge the line, it attempts to break the line, and then only to come back, and then come back up again, and then now it's re-challenging the line a second time. Okay, it's re-challenging the line a second time. So next week, all right, next week, what I'm going to assume is this, whether the S&P breaks the 50-day moving average or not, it's going to be dependent on this little fellow over here. Or not little fellow, but this, this big little stock over here. Yeah, all right, on what Apple does. Okay, so if Apple is going to break all the way back up and go uh, challenge, you know, the maybe a 130 level again, right, then we should see the S&P, all right, take a little bit more control. But still having said that, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm still uh, very wary because I feel that there will be another sell-off uh, when the indicators are able to get back to overbought levels yeah okay now so i still feel that there's more selling in, in the market so i'm going to take advantage of exhaustion stocks that means stocks that have been sold and exhausted which we have spotted a couple already right and we may cover them in our live trading session with some of our community members tomorrow yeah okay i think it'll be an exciting week ahead of us and uh we've been patient basically i think we've been patient but uh, there are very clear reasons on why we should be patient over here because this is one, Apple, all right? And uh, let's just look at, look, take a look at some other people's darling. Can you see Facebook is the same, Jeremy? All right, it's also below the 50-day moving average. All right, and then uh, we have Amazon, all right? Which is also the, below the 50-day moving average. So two things now we can see happening. One, if we see a big surge on Monday, all right, then we may have the break for the rest of the week. That means uh, we may have some positivity getting injected for the rest of the week. Two. If uh, selling resumes on Monday, that means, you know, there is more uh, kind of sell side activity. Yeah. Okay. Now, because what I would say so far is this, in the first round of a sell-off, I'm going to end it here already. Don't worry. Okay. Now, in the first round of the sell-off, the retail investors who have made the money all the way up. Okay. Let me, let me zoom out on this. Okay. That means if you're a retail investor and you're in Amazon, for example, and you have bought it all the way up, okay, all the way up. Okay, and the first time you see it crack like that, okay, you may have sold off some, but there will always be those residual positions where you're going, ah, should I sell everything? Uh, since I made so much money, maybe I'll hang on a little bit longer to see what it's possible. Yeah, okay. Now, but when they see this, okay, and then you get the next shake out, let's say Amazon drops another 10%, that's when you probably get them shaking. Yeah, okay, no, because something something that I've learned, you know, after after many, many years over here, and there is this, okay, I, I'm going to bring it back to you. Okay, and, and please understand when I do this, okay, please understand when I do this. I have all the respect for Tesla, because if you're going to ask me if Tesla's cars are pretty, they are pretty. Yeah, all right, are their price amazing? Outside of Singapore, their prices for the prettiness of the car is amazing. Yeah, all right. In Singapore, no. All right. Outside of Singapore, yes. Yeah, okay. All right. Now, can their cars sell? 
Yes. Okay, but there are some problems. They can't produce the car fast enough. That's definitely one. And that's still a problem that they aren't really solving. Okay, now, so they, they are hampering their growth a little bit by their own hands. Okay, and second, second, the biggest problem is this. When a stock is being liked, okay, when a stock is being liked, and it's liked because, you know, we all know what Tesla did. It went from 300 to 2,000, all right, and then it did a split, all right, and then uh, it's still doing well, correct? Yeah, now, but the problem is this. Every liked stock will continue to be liked, all right, until you see Tesla prices go to 100. Right? Because once Tesla can show investors that the price can go back to 100, they will never be liked. Right? And, and you, have to, you have to understand this. Every, everything like that has happened. Right? Because Toyota was probably in Tesla's phase when they were much younger. So they would have gone into this phase as well where they were really, really liked. Right? And then soon they became normal. Yeah? Okay? And normal when you know, their profits do not show as well, they start to become a little bit unlike. Yeah, okay, now, so it is always a very dangerous game, all right, when you enter a stock, especially when you enter a stock late, all right, late, okay, really late, especially, all right, you need to start leveraging on a lot more tools, which means when you're entering a stock like Tesla late, please, please don't tell me, Terrence, I'm buying it because I like Elon Musk. Terrence, I'm buying it because I like his dreams. No, you can't. While I agree he's a great man, he's done you know, a lot of magical things. He can, he, he can potentially change the world. But the problem is stock markets always behave the same way. They suck everyone in, and once they're done sucking everyone in, right, they go for the kill. All right, and you don't want to be there for the kill. Yeah, okay? All right, now, so I'm done with my market segment. I just want to bring some lights uh, into the market. All right, and like we said, there are always going to be undervalued companies amidst every kind of market condition. And today, I think Jeremy just unearthed another one over here. And we're going to let Jeremy take his show now. Jeremy, over to you. All right. Thank you, Terrence. Right. So, like Terrence say, um, we don't want to actually enter a company when it's actually late. It means to say that the stock has already moved and um, that uh, the prices has already moved, left the boat. The, 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 the prices have already left the harbor here. So, today, if I if my record serves me well, right, we we're looking at the 12th, my 12th sharing in terms of the stock for the uh, series. And um, coincidentally, this is actually the first of its kind for this type of sharing, this type of analysis that I'm actually doing for the, the company, whereby uh, it's going to feel very different from what I've done in the last few series, at least when I, I feel so, when I was actually preparing the company. Yeah, so for those of you shop eye viewers who have been with us for a while, you're going to feel very uncomfortable here. I assure you, you're going to feel uncomfortable because this is not what I have usually been doing. And uh, just sit tight and then uh, let me finish the, the show and then you can see why am I coming from in terms of my analysis here. Now, of course, before we start here, I need to let uh, I need to show just let uh, everyone know that this is a disclaimer here. Whatever company we're sharing here is actually purely for education purposes. So we may or may not be taking positions in them because uh, the replace the should be available on Facebook. So depending on the time you watch this video, we might or might not have actually taken the positions on them as well. So do do your own due diligence, due diligence before you actually uh, consider any trades on this company as well. Now, um, at this point in time, right, you will notice that in terms of looking for uh, our definition of undervalued companies, right? We will be seeing common theme, which is number one, this company tends to be financial institutes. We're looking at banks, we're looking at insurance companies, or we're looking at something got to do with finance industry. The other type will actually be companies that are linked to China, right? So, coincidentally or not, so um, we have actually covered some China companies in the past. I think we need Momo. And I also did Unum, which is a financial company. It's like an insurance company here. So today we're actually doing another Chinese company here. We'll be doing China Uchai International Limited, CYD. All right. So um, this company, just very quick outlook uh, profile in terms of what it does, is actually founded in 1951. It is based in Singapore in terms of its quarters. Uh, what it does is that actually through its uh, subsidiaries, actually manufactures and sells 
the gas engines. We're looking at diesel, natural gas engines in China itself, and as well as international markets. Now, what they do is they actually provide diesel engines, right, of all kinds, most kinds, to um, a wide variety of different markets here. Now, they also do manufacturing of diesel engines for the construction, as well as agriculture, agricultural applications, as well as for supplies of aftermarkets, that means after wholesale, wholesale services in a way, for the powertrain systems as well. They also start to move into hospitality as well as property development activities. And uh, they also kind of like do uh, exhaust emission control systems in a way. So what it does is that it is mostly related to something that we uh, might not find very, I would use the word sexy, you know, something that we will come across uh, as, a, as a company that we, we usually would look at. Just it's been tagged, it's been tagged, it's been tagged for the last few years. We've been looking at Apple, been looking at Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Facebook. Yeah, so something back to something more traditional, manufacturing, engines, China market, yada, yada. Right, so I'm going to jump straight into the Morningstar numbers. And you will find that the Morningstar numbers is definitely going to make you uncomfortable here. So if you have any questions, don't need to hold back. Just post your questions in the comments and we go through them at the Q&A portion of the segment today. Uh, and we will we will be sharing with you a new way that why, why are we doing the analysis here in this of this company here, all right? So here, we look at the trailing returns of the company here. All right, you can see that, CYD, uh, let's see. Ah, okay. I think I've got the company mix in the same sense here. Just a second here. So what happened is that CYD as a company, right, as I was doing the uh, analysis earlier, it was actually kind of like not really thrilling in terms of its uh, numbers. So let's just go straight there. Sorry for the hiccup here. Right, this is the numbers that we should be looking at for this part here. Okay, so for CYD here, you can see that the sector itself, right, is actually kind of like a bit contracting the last three years, one year itself. Yeah, but the company itself, right, has been showing a bit of, a little bit of prominence in terms of its one year numbers. Uh, and as well as the year to date, it's actually kind of like performing as compared to the sector, which is kind of like down here. Now, it, it kind of, it kind of have a bit of a diversion in terms of the overall view. So you can't really say for sure whether this sector is what is really going on in terms of the drilling numbers, because frankly, you, you can't really say, like, is it the case that this, this is a company issue or this is a sector issue? And the fact that COVID-19 kind of like right, uh, mess up the whole momentum globally, as well as the fact that China is the is anomaly being the only country that has recovered very strongly, doesn't really help this part here. Now you will notice that a lot of the numbers that we see in Morningstar, right, will have uh will require a lot of discretion in terms of how you look at it. It requires a level, a higher and deeper level of thinking when you actually analyze them today, right? So let me go back to the slides here. Pardon the technical difficulty. Can I just can I just inject something? Sure. While while you were mentioning that uh, you're taking a new uh, analysis approach today, so the usual way would be to seek out value, right? So how will you describe your methodology today? And the we're, we're still seeking out value. It's just that the 
the usual way of seeking out value, right, will will require today seeking out value will require a little bit of deeper thinking and more references to more sources of information here. So okay. the the shifting and the perspective in terms of the context of the information will also be required. More of that. Okay. So we, we okay. will move into that, yeah. Right? All right. I just wanted to help I just want to help our attendees uh draw you know a little bit of perspective before you go ahead. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, that, okay, that, that, ahead, yeah. All right, okay. So we look at the financial numbers here. If you have been following our series, you'll see that the financial numbers is something you really, really need to stand up and you need to see that. We really have to pay attention. Price look under one, price cash flow, price sale, price earnings, all under 10. This is really something very cheap, just on absolute terms. Even though I have won a lot of times not to just look at them on their own in isolation, just having them and the numbers in this sense here needs you to pay strong attention to this. This is what actually caught my attention when I was doing my screening and I prepared for the series today. All right. So we have them all under book value, attractive price X ratios. Moving along. Now, it, the problem with the company is that when we will uh, move into the later segment, usually we will see that our oh, Tinkerswing will actually have the book value of the company. Now, the thing is that for this company, Tinkerswing doesn't provide the book value. So what we need to do is actually we need to do the calculation for the book value ourselves. So what we've done is that I've done the calculation here. The prices for the stock as it closes was about 18.65. And using the price book, well, 0.42, we could determine that the book value per share is about $44.40. Okay, so just need to remember $44.40. And then you recall back price of the stock is at $18.65. For sure, you know that Hey, I, if let's say, for example, I long the stock today, and then the stock does liquidate immediately without any red tape, without any delay, I should technically be getting back more dollars for my same dollar in terms of like liquidation work. All right. Now, moving along, under the financials, we see that, hey, the revenue and the net income actually grow. Revenue, net income grow. But the earnings per share actually fell. Okay, so this is as of 2019, 31st of December. Okay, now typically if you see these, right, this is actually a case whereby you see that, um, well, maybe the company is going through something that, uh, what is it called? Something happened that happened structurally or in terms of systematic, they say affecting the sector or the company as a whole, such that they have no choice that despite having a growth in the net income, yeah, earnings per share, still falling. Okay. So based on the last few CVs, if you see that there's a fall in earnings per share, you would generally feel that, hey, this company is something that we should be avoiding at all costs. All right. This was also part of my train of thought as I was looking at it. But as I looked further into the company, I started to feel less of this. All right. I will share with you why. Now, we're looking at the financial health of the company. This is as of 30th of June, the end of the second quarter here. The quick ratio and the current ratio, the liquidity ratio company is actually three plus. We're looking at very excellent uh, amount of cash flows whereby they can actually afford for their short term liquidity. And the debt equity of 0 0.05 is actually very low for the company in this health reserve. So I'm not concerned in terms of the health, in terms of whether they are actually able to maintain their short term and also long term liability just from this angle here. Okay. So this is not a company that will be plagued by debt or by liability, be it short or long term, at least from these numbers here. Now the current the current company in terms of the second quarter for the year is actually profitable now, right? Profitable already. So this is always a good sign. Why? COVID-19, second quarter, profitable. Enough said. Because we find that in this current environment, just staying profitable, gaining revenue is one. Staying profitable is the next. So staying profitable in this current market is actually a good sign. And uh, we will be able to see whether the company can just remain profitable moving forward in the third and the fourth quarter. All right. In fact, if I uh, could put, share some perspectives, right, I do recall in sometime in August, the company actually beat their earnings estimates uh, and that actually caused the increase in the stock price significantly. Right. 
Now we move on to the income statement for the company. Now we see that as of uh, 2019, comparing 2019 to the trailing 12 months numbers, we could see a fall cross board. In fact, if we could compare, right, the normalized value earnings per share is less than half of the figure in 2019. Now, if I were to do the uh, just like for like comparison, we are now in September. And I believe that uh, the August numbers that has been announced will only account for the second quarter of the year. Now, just based on that, right, it would it would seem that there is a less likelihood that the trailing the 2020 numbers will actually meet or even beat the 2019 numbers. That being said, that being said, okay, now this on its own is a bad thing. This on its own is a bad thing. That being said, if I put in the perspective, 2020 is a year whereby the word unprecedented, unprecedented was overused. So if in a unprecedented year, the numbers eventually don't fall too far off from 2019 figures, this will might not be a too bad thing. Okay, this is where I, I need you to put into perspective to the numbers here. Perspectives into the numbers here. This, this requires a little bit of thinking process, the analysis here. Right. So factually, trailing 12 months income numbers are slated to be off the 2019 figures, but this might not be too far off, too bad in certain sense. Okay. Right. So in the balance sheets of these numbers, where we see that as of the second quarter of the year, the total assets of the company actually fell. And uh, we see that this seems to be trend here from 2018 onwards. At the same time, right, the equity also fell, but you will see that equity fell by about 0.23 in terms of billion, whereas the total assets fell by more than that, definitely more than that. We're looking about uh, 1.11 1. yeah, $1. billion. So I would say that even though assets-wise they fell, the amount of the equity didn't fall by as much. So the holy trinity in terms of the accounting formula, assets minus liability is equal to equity. We will see that, okay, so assets, assets is the concern is we don't want them to be disposing assets so that they can free up liquidity and then uh, they'll be selling their long-term capability for short-term liability. Okay. So they are dropping in assets, yes, but equity numbers wise don't seem to be dropping too much. So this, while I need to pay attention to this, I'm not too much concerned by this. So again, this is where you need to you need to take into perspectives. This asset dropping, yes, it is bad. But the equity numbers didn't fail so drastically. It is something I might be able to start now. Now let's move on. Now again, if we look at the triple cat, the, the three different statements, right? The cash flow statement is the one that's most stellar. Now the operating cash flow for the Shoji Chow funds right, actually went much better. In then the 20, 2019 overall numbers. For operating numbers in terms of cash flow is actually 1.37. It's about close to uh, four times the number of 2019 whole year's figure. And with that, right, the free cash flow numbers also went ahead and actually improved a lot by the 2019 figures. So yes, this is something like a a, a good sign in the sense uh, in the in the midst of all the different figures that I see that we needed to put in the perspectives to see whether there's anything good here. Now, for some of you who are, who are, who are more skeptical, maybe thinking, hey, Jeremy is being one-sided here. You're being tunnel vision. You think that a, uh, you, you're just focusing on the, the point that, oh, this company is good. That's why you're finding all the factors that is good. Yes, you, you, I would not say that you are wrong because what I'm trying to prove, uh, what I will be able to do is I will be able to prove you that there are reasons that show that Yes, this company is in for some possible uh, exciting moments here. Now, let, let's just stay, stay on the edge of the chair, okay? Now, uh, look at the valuation here. See? Now, compared to the last sessions, last few sessions, we do have a five-year average numbers here. So we can't just do it very simply, just compare against five-year numbers. Okay, so what we can do is take the current number, compare against the index. It is for sure price sales, price earnings, price cash flow, price book. Except for price book, 
price sale, price earnings, price cash flow, this to me, they all measure enthusiasm. These three parameters are all lower than the index. Number one, this company is still not being uh, recognized by the general public in terms of, in terms of the market participants. Number two, if you compare the current numbers against what happened in the last few years, you find that most of the numbers in the past few years had been higher. Okay. This is where I need you to start doing a little bit of processing of these numbers. Now, for those of you who have been in IMB community, you would have heard of what Terence have been drilling into us since we started our very first weekend into the IMP training. When you are a CEO of a company, and especially a blue chip company, let's just say a company, and you have a case whereby your company's performance is bad, is bad for the quarter, is bad for the year, what will you do? What will you do so that in the next quarter, you will not be seen as bad? Now, the natural thing to do is you will take the chance, you will take the opportunity to lower your guidance. You will take the chance to lower the expectation and you keep doing so. You will lower it, you will lower it, and you will lower it until finally it goes so low that, hey, no matter what you do, it will go over the, <laughs> lower the expectation. Now, this is the first thing. The first layer is expectations will always go lower, one, until when your company has no choice but to go over, go better than that, first thing. Second thing is, factually, in terms of numbers, if I use a five-year moving average, five-year moving average time frame, if the company had been performing very strongly at the start of these five-year numbers, and then they started going down, your five-year average will actually be something like affected by the very strong numbers at the start maybe the first two years in five average. Once your new years, the sixth year come in, first year has to go out, this five year moving time frame. That means your five year range has to drop. Your five year range has to drop and your five year range has to drop. Now, if I ask you, as a, uh, as a market participant, you're looking at the reports. You're looking at the reports. You will need to you need to do a research. And this is not just the only company you'll be researching into them. You have to find an efficient way to be looking into these companies. Now, of course, one year you can do is use a five-year average, you look into them, and then you see that, hey, this company seems to be approaching its five-year numbers. It's actually better, performing better than five-year numbers because mathematically, the five-year numbers will actually improve because the company has been lowering itself. At the same time, if the companies uh, what they call it, the, the, the performance seems to have fallen to the, lo the lowest of its kind. It can't go for lower. It will just bounce back. Then you are coming to a point by the five-year average and the current numbers will just cross each other, intersect. So this is the point whereby I'm just guessing whether this company is at this juncture. All right. So, so if you can visualize what I'm trying to say is that, hey, this company has been in such a bad state so long that I'm just thinking this might actually be happening now, especially given that in August, the earnings actually beat the estimates. So this, this kind of adds to another, another support that this is happening. This is next one. Huh? All right. So we see returns ratio. So yes, again, the five year, average energy that I'm bringing here. So you see that currently the 12, 12 month numbers, they are all worse than the five year average. And as we look in the five year numbers, they will slowly go contribute into the five year average figure. So once this company has anything slow, small in terms of improvement, and they trail closer, closer to the five year average, it's going to be a, a world of difference to the to the day-to-day -day market participants, hey, the, the company actually improved a lot already because you're comparing against the, 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 the floor. Yeah. So the, the numbers here, 
In number C, if I just use the analysis style right for the last 12 sessions, right? Frankly, they don't they don't support they don't support the, the bullish outlook. I'm bullish if you haven't realized this. So here's what that actually really confirmed my view. Now, if you haven't realized, right, sometimes we, what we do is that we use other sources of information to actually look into the company. Now, this is from Simply Wall Street. Okay, now, under here, the last updated for this data, this screening is actually for 29, on the 20, sorry, 26th of September, just a few days back. All right? And we see that, hey, there's only one risk here. Now, when you look at such assisted screening services, take everything you see with a pinch of salt, except for factual data. Everything that they say is opinion, opinion and opinion, and they're all relative. Except for factual data, then you can rely on them. So this to me is opinion. Okay, opinion, 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 opinion. And they view that, they view that out of the whole thing, whole list of things that they check for, only the share prices are volatile. To them, this is a risk. This is an opinion to me. All right, this is the opinion to me. But what that truly, truly stands out, this is also an opinion. Fair value wise, they have a calculation that they say that, hey, uh, the current price is about 1865. They view that the fair value is about $173. Of course, some of you, some of our viewers will believe that, hey, this is something that I really need to look into. Yes, sure. By all means, you can actually refer to that. But this is where, hey, this is factual. PEG ratio is less than one. So for some of you who are not aware, PEG ratio is kind of like a measurement whereby it measures how much attention this company has been receiving in terms of uh, its futures growth. Future growth. If PEG ratio is less than one, it means to say that this company has the potential to have an explosive return by just purely by fundamental metrics. If I can just put it in a very layman context. Yeah, let me take a drink. Eh? In the meantime, if you haven't lost me, if you haven't lost me, maybe you can just type a hi or a hello, hello in the comments before I go into the next portion, which really, really sealed the deal for this company. Okay. Now, the thing with Simply Wall Street is that they also are able to screen for the shareholders for the company. And we notice that there's a company that we might be more familiar with, which is Hong Kong Investment Holdings, right? So this is where it really, really truly seals the deal for me, which is here. There was this insider transaction that happened sometime on the 18th of September this year that the company bought in about 8 million worth of shares, right? Or about 486,000 shares at $18.07. Now, if I ask you, the majority shareholder of the company, majority shareholder of the company, some people actually believe that this is a real bank. Some people believe it's a financial company. Fine. It's an investment holding. All right. They are actually willing to purchase the share at $18.07. Does it not mean that? To a certain level, they believe that eighteen dollars and seven cents is something cheap to them. Or, if I just put it more factual, they are willing to put in eighteen dollars and seven cents to purchase this shares from the open market. Whereby, if the share price goes to eighteen dollars and seven cents, are they not willing to defend that? Now, this is something that insider transactions, right? Insider transactions is something that I pay attention to when I can spot them and. Coincidentally for this, I then was able to do it. So as I was looking at the whole list of the data, this is when I, it, it struck me. Is this something that we are not aware of that the majority shareholder, majority shareholder is aware of that led them to actually contribute more funds to actually buy into the company share and uh, in so doing, are able to retain more of their revenue or their, their earnings, you know, the future dividends, so that they can save on future dividends paid up eventually. So with that, actually, I was actually thinking, hey, this is a bullish play I can play, but I will play differently. 
very different. Okay, so what I did is I look at a budget call spread and as well as a call, direct, a direct call options that I was looking for. The budget call spread was actually considered because I know that some of our viewers would have budget constraints. So yes, we're looking at the furthest expiry, 21st of May for the year 2021. And uh, for the width of $2.50, and, $2 and uh, you're actually going to be setting aside about $78. Now, this to me is not really the preferred trade of choice because you kept your returns. But this is something that I would say if I am trying to participate in an upside because I really believe in the story that I shared, the, 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 the profile of the company I shared. Yes, then this might be this $78 I will, might be willing to give it a try for one contract. Personally, if you ask me, I will be going more for my own style. I'll be going more for the $20 call. Right. So I think with that, right, the, the plain, the plain simple reason for this trade, the caveats is that very simply, just cut loss if the trade don't go in your favor. No need to complicate the matter. No need to complicate the matter. So if you find that the trade, because you're gonna, if you're gonna be taking the trade, you're gonna be doing it until May next year. So we'll be looking about eight months, 10 months around there months, nine months about that. So as long as you find that, hey, I'm not comfortable, cut, take back the premiums. Whatever you can salvage, just salvage it. So yeah, so for that, I am actually taking this way because it is a fixed loss. Whatever I pay is the risk of willing I'm willing to set aside to participate in the upside. So that is why I say today's sharing is very different because it requires you to actually set aside the perspectives of, is it worse or is it worse off than the worst that kind of thing so yeah that's for me parents you have any opinion on my sharing um okay now so let me just put some perspective as well uh i have a varied i have a varied uh view on this company as a whole <clears throat> so no buy And what do I see okay, from uh, some of the sources that I go with? Uh, so just let, let, let me find out and let me help Jeremy out as well. So if you're still with us at the moment, can you just drop a note, type a one in the comment, all right? Leave a figure of one in the comment so we know that you're still uh, with us. We have not lost you in today's heavy, heavy analysis session. <laughs> Jeremy, you got heavy weight today. <laughs> all right, I'm leave a comment with us. With us, yeah, Terrence, right? I must, yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Terrence, yeah, yeah, Terrence, I must admit, this is this is something really uh seldom comes on my lap as I look at it because, um, for me, I am I'm a firm believer of imperfect market knowledge whereby the presence of insider transactions, right, actually does have their place, and if we could capture on the lease. Uh, we could we could benefits from the, the market as a whole. Personally, I also have taken some trades from insider transactions in Singapore markets that I've spotted. And uh, yes, I, I do find it lucrative in certain sense, but it's seldom that I come across a, a, a one whereby the Morningstar numbers is so, it's so lopsided, but after you put in the deeper level analysis of the time and the shifting perspective of the moving time frame, you notice that maybe your 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 decision will be a little bit different. So yeah, yeah, I, I'm really very excited for today's sharing. I can tell. Don't worry, I can tell. <laughs> uh, I just want to put some perspective. Uh, some some are definitely in your favor because uh, your go to source is simply Wall Street. But uh, for me, it's been Seeking Alpha, right? And uh, Seeking Alpha has some uh, new features for uh, subscribers to their website, and that's what they call the factor grades. Uh, so what they do is they use some of their quants over here uh, to do some quant ranking, ranking and factor grades on fundamental numbers. So what you can see over here is I'm pulling up uh, your company, China Use High over here, right? And mm. it, it's scoring pretty well, okay? It's scoring pretty well except for the profitability at the moment, which is what you have already highlighted as well, 
Yeah. Okay, but uh, it seems that things are improving because from three months ago, it has a C grade on growth as well as uh, any revisions from analysts, but uh, all has gone up a notch. So uh, things seems to be better and it definitely has the momentum and definitely value like you highlighted. Now, so uh, also in another sense is Wall Street, uh, Wall Street is very bullish right now on this counter. Okay, now, uh, some of you will be asking, Terrence, you know, how, how reliable is this factor grade? Now, so the only way to check is reliability is to compare it with a couple of other stocks. So what I'll do is I'll compare it with one, uh, the next stock, which is AT&T. Okay, now AT&T is a simple telco company. So yes, it's still doing decently okay, all right? And it's a dividend kind of stock play. But if you look at the factor grades, you can drastically see the difference. Right. Yes, there is some value to it because prices have been suppressed, right? but no, there's definitely no growth to this company. Right? It's rated badly on growth. And because the stock prices have not, you know, you see from here, right? All right? It's not really moved by much. So it gets a D plus on momentum as well. Yeah. Okay. Now, so profitability wise, the company has no issues, right? Value wise, because it's depressed prices. So you get some value out of it, but it shows you that growth and, you know, momentum is definitely not there. Okay, and even Wall Street itself is pretty neutral on their ratings. Now, okay, and of course, that's not fair enough because we're taking like, you know, a, a cash cow company. But let's take another growth company like Apple. Okay, so I also put Apple into the picture because we all know Apple is uh, a mature growth. Okay, it's like an old, old dog here right now. But growth is rated C with Apple while their profitability momentums are still A. Why momentum is A? Because Apple has been surging. All right, and that means momentum basically means the price momentum, okay? Now, but value-wise, because of how high it is right now, right, it's definitely of no value because you're chasing prices, yeah? Okay, and that's very clear, of course, because Apple right now is trading at 34 PE, okay? Apple is trading at 34 PE, and you must understand, Apple and their products, right, they are not like Tesla. So I know some of you are going to tell me, but Tesla, uh, you know, Terrence, Tesla is warranted because they are a growth company. Yeah, Apple is technically not a growth company anymore. Yes, they're growing, but they are like a blue chip growth right now. Okay, they have already achieved dominant market position. Yeah, okay, so once once any company has achieved dominant market positions, the one thing that you'll see over here is this, their profit growth has to slow. Why does it have to slow? Because even if they, for example, they have 70% market share this year, uh, last year, and then they grew, grew it to 72% market share, Right now, the profitability comes from the extra 2%. Where else, if it's Tesla, they were 0% when it comes to car market share. And then they grow from 0% to 10% of the market share. Now, that's worth a lot of money because the entire sector is very big. So even if you can chunk off 10%, that equates to a lot of money. Yeah? Okay, now, so I mean, comparing with a few companies over here, I think, uh, you know, from a fundamental perspective, what Jeremy brought out over here does have some uh, sense in terms of getting bullish or being a little bit uh, bullish on his picture. Okay, but at the same time, I do have my own reservations. So from fundamental, yes, I agree with what you say, Jeremy. Okay, but from a technical side, as you know now, suddenly I became a bit more technical, right? <laughs> now, so from a technical side, okay, uh, things look okay. All right, that means uh, we have the daily chart. I'm going with the daily chart first, okay? Now, so uh, it is now moving and trading in the new box because it broke out over here together with a break in the Bollinger Band, right? So it broke out from the Bollinger Band into a new range. So this can be considered like a simple breakout. Okay, so you had a breakout over here, all right? And then it continues surging, okay? Now, so uh, what we see then is this, okay? We see that uh, it has obviously gone into overstretch levels. The RSI is like at 79, okay? When it has this breakout. Okay, so of course, after that, it sustained, you know, it sustained this for a very, 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 very long time. Okay, it's like up there, way up there for a very long time right now. So what, what it leads me, what it leads me to think about, right, is this. This is my concern, right? It leads me to think about like this. You see, uh, Spy was, you know, up there for a while. And then it's been dragging, 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 dragging at overbought levels. So yes, Jeremy, it can chuck along, right? That means the upside can still keep going. But uh, how do I say this? But I don't expect another breakout. That's my concern, okay? That means 
it can chart a lot because all the market signs are showing that it's been overstretched, it's been overbought. You know, so the the, the short term traders, the technicians, they're not going to get in. They're not going to get in because you know until this comes back a bit lower. If the RSI can come back to like fifty levels, maybe they will look to get in because they are trading the trend. But they would they would uh, shy away from taking new positions at these kind of very pressured levels. Okay, very pressured levels. So I mean, in terms of how I'll look at it, it's I will look for an entry. I'll look for an entry when I see these indicators and oscillators come come off to the middle. It, that means if I'm trading this stock because of trend, which is definitely what you're talking about right now, you value the fundamentals, right? And you're looking for the trend. That means the up moving trend now, because uh, one of their biggest shareholders have bought more shares recently. Okay, that I agree. That I agree. Okay, and actually when you showed that list, I happened to see Renaissance Technologies as well. And I really like Renaissance Technology as a, a fund. Okay, any of you who have not heard of them, you should go to Google itself and go and Google Renaissance uh, Renaissance Fund, right? They have really done very well for a very long time and they're still a very obscure kind of fund. That means very, very little people know about them. Yeah, okay, all right, but their results are outstanding. Yeah, okay, go, go, go do, do a search on them. You'll find out more. Now, so on my part over here, I would perhaps wait a little bit more patiently. That means maybe I'll wait for you to come back close enough to the 50-day moving average. Yeah, all right. Or maybe back to the bottom of the box. Okay, for whatever reason. Because maybe, you know, in, my, in the back of my head, like I said as well, the sellers have control now. So if the market sells off, you know, most stocks would be dragged along. Okay, now, and uh, something that is more concerning to me uh, it's also this. When I pull this time frame to a longer time frame, that means a weekly, right? Okay, now the weeklies are where it's it's momentum. You get a lot of momentum, all right? But the weeklies are just a little bit overstretched for my liking. Yeah, all right? It's just a little bit overstretched for my liking because you have the RSI that it's going all the way to 76 now. All right, 76. So the higher it gets, the, you know, the, the, the more pressure it, there is, right? Uh, for the stock to wane on its strength of the move. Yeah, all right. Now, but one thing for it, one thing is definitely this. On the longer term, right, you can see that the momentum strength is gaining. That means the uptrend. You mentioned, right, the accumulation, right, is definitely happening. Right, it's definitely happening over here because you can see as the prices were going up after the breakout, right? Okay, as it was going up over here, you can see that you know there's there's a one-way channel when it comes to accumulation. All right, that means there's more and more buying over here. This is just an accumulation distribution kind of indicator. All right, so you can see that the accumulation is definitely happening as the stock price is going up. So this is definitely for for the uptrend over here. Okay, now. So uh, I think I briefly mentioned this in the past uh, sessions that unfortunately, I'm not so much a trend trader. I'm more of a contrarian trader. So anything that's, <laughs> yes, anything that's a bit overstretched, I believe in the rubber band theor theory. Right? Hence, you realize my, my stand with Apple, my stand with Tesla. Yeah, all right now. So I just don't really like the fact that everything I'm seeing is pointing to an overstretched level. So even if I pull the trigger, I would want it to come back to a more sustainable level. Why, why, why do I say this? Because a little bit of times when you enter a trade, you have to look at the pros and the cons, right? Now, so, uh, you know, just now, just now on the daily chart, we saw a breakout. We saw a breakout, agree, right? But it's not confirmed. That's one problem. It's not confirmed. So we'll probably have to wait for the next one or two days to see if it closes outside that, that, that resistance. Okay, and then here on the weekly chart, okay, on the weekly chart, you can see that it's clearly still inside the box. So if you enter a trade right now and then it starts to oscillate down, right? You could actually see that it could go from 18, all right, all the way down to 15. Because hitting the top of the box and coming back to the bottom of the box, right? Yeah, all right, that's just my thinking. Huh? Yeah, okay, but that can happen. I so, think Karen, right? Um, yeah, um, uh just to set the discussion in this in this perspective here, I think in terms of technical analysis, I do agree with you that in terms of the technicals, the signals, yes, the 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 point, the entry point does leave a lot of room for desire. But uh, my personal my personal view is uh, 
as I was structuring the trade, right, I wasn't really looking at this from a technical view. I wasn't really, I wasn't fully looking at this from a fundamental point of view. Yes, I, 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 know, I know. That's why, yeah. that's why from, from my part over here, I'm just trying to put in an extra kind of perspective. All right, all right. So, so I mean, I, I, I think what we, we, we have here, because I, I do notice it's about five plus, right? I just want to squeeze in that part because I noticed something that, that struck me immediately during the point where you're sharing that, that I don't know whether we could link it. I'm just thinking whether this trade that I am doing, right, is something linked to a binary event trade. Uh, it could be because, uh, okay, how do I say this? I feel that I feel that definitely for you know their main shareholder like Hong Leong itself to buy so deep and so expensive in your company, it's definitely whether we like it or not, they know something. They know something yes. that we don't. But yes. it's, it is also it is also gonna flout it is also gonna flout the SEC rules and regulations if they let this announcement happen in the next one month. Because that's really gonna put them in insider trade. No. Okay. So, so what what I what I see maybe this they may be trying to position themselves ahead, which means like you said the numbers are improving, and from what I see they're still announcing their earnings every quarter, so maybe they are positioning in for their profit announcement in November, that could be a play. That means they clearly I... see that they're doing better and better, and they expect you know a very very strong number in November to end the year, so they're getting in now. Right, so that you know, three months later when they do announce it, right, then you know whatever they want to do after that, they can do it. You know whether they can put in a plain scheduled selling or something like that, whatever it is. Or from there, right, they do a divestiture or they do a M and A with another company. You know, at, at uh, you know better valuations. Yeah, so that that can be a possibility. I'm so saying, I, I, I see. Yeah, yeah, I, I see your train of thought is not logical, but. Mm. I'm more looking in terms of like something more macro. Like the last few days headlines has been Sinovac. Mm. Sinovac has been saying that, hey, we, we have got it right. We are ready. You just need to wait for 2021. We have the vaccine ready. For those of you who are not aware, Sinovac is the Chinese company that has, uh, contrary to what the Western uh, pharmaceutical companies, they actually did a vaccine based on the traditional vaccine, i.e. to say, they reconfirmed the virus to have, a, I think it was a two time different injection for your body to actually fight the weakened form and then to activate the immune response. So what they are claiming now is that the uh, entire staff, population of staff, as well as uh, certain uh, essential staffs has already been vaccinated without any much side effect. Of course, the skeptical ones will always say that, hey, China is news is not going to pass through the Great Wall of Firewalls of China. Yes, I, I, I totally agree with your view. Yes, yes, certain news will not go through. But my view is that if, let's say, for example, there are viewers, our viewers out there who still believes in the the pharmaceutical play, the uh, the vaccine play whereby the economy will recover once there's a vaccine available, then because... Uh, Chinese reader, the IV percentile, if I'm not wrong, is at 13% or 14%. How? Then the, at the $78 or $200 plus for the pure core, then it might be a worthy consideration. This is my, my, my honest consideration because I, I just think that if, let's say, for example, if I were to refer to the Morningstar uh, article on the Morningstar, sorry, Seeking Alpha, Seeking alpha sharings, right? The seeking alpha sharings on the articles that were shared, right? I think within the three articles, the last three is actually 2017. That means to say this this company has not yeah. been under yeah, 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 he's been he's been under the radar for the longest time. So uh I don't I don't deny with your your I don't disagree with how you're looking at the technical analysis, but I'm just thinking whether it's it's worth a shot, like uh. right? do yes. we, does any of our viewers does any of our viewers have an opinion? Uncle Fu. Ah, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. Uncle Fu, any view? 
But while, while we wait for you know their opinion over here, this is actually where I was going to lead to the summary of the session because I, I was just going to put in the fact that if you are trying to trade this stock on the short term, that means you're trying to get in and out. You know, like, mm. like the way you structure your call spread because you're taking into consideration that, you know, it's just a trade and then a small, small kind of capital trade. So yes, that is when you probably want to time your trade in better. But on the position where you are willing to sacrifice the losses by buying a call option, mm. you can go. That you can go because you're playing that on a longer term perspective and on the event uh, and on your uh, rationale playing out. And even if you're wrong, right, you already have a fixed loss amount that is set aside because of the premiums that you pay to buy the call options. That is fine. Yes. Ah, so yes. that's why a lot of times when you know option newbies or when they come into the market, they just think like they can come in over here and then get a killing. It's not, it's not difficult. Please understand this. It's not difficult. But to become good at everything, it takes a period of practice. It takes a period of practice and realization of what is right, what is not right. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> then we just have to highlight that. <laughs> No, Uncle Fu, it's not to it's not really not to put you on the spot here, but it's more like um I really I really respect your 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 view. So I'm just thinking like what uh what would be your 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 decision here? Because sometimes you do have very clear uh I would say maybe digital matrix on how you how you decide things. Yeah. Yes. He's stepping on you, Uncle Fu, because he knows that you are a China expert. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, yeah. I think I think like you said as well, if you are positioning on a longer term, I have no objections to getting in on a trade now because you have defined losses. Okay, but mm. uh, if you're trying to gun a trade, like you know, any call spread trade, that is a very short term focus trade, and then you need the stock to move. And that's where mm. you know trying to time, trying to get the maximum exposure from a possible burst up move will be more advantageous. Mm. You, you see where I'm driving from, right? Yeah, okay, because you must also understand this. For example, you were saying that you're going to aim for the May, May uh, call option. Yes, 20. Okay. You have to understand as well, if you want to buy an out-of-the-money call option, right, then you, what you're doing is you're paying for time value. Yeah. So, so what's happening is if you don't have a stock that can possibly burst, right, every day that it doesn't move, right, right you're going to get a decay in the time value. So if you just keep... Okay, you see where I'm coming from. If it really oscillates back down to 15 over here, right? Then what's going to happen is this. What's going to happen is you're probably going to see that your premiums drops from uh, potentially maybe say $2.10 or $2.20 that you're paying, right? You may see it fall all the way to like $160 or 150 And then you have to understand, you have lesser time now, which means that you need an even bigger burst, right? Not only from 15 back to 18, but for possibly after 18, you need to go to 20, 21, all right, for this call option that you're buying to actually become profitable. Mm. So you, you see where I'm coming from, only, right? Now, yes, so yes. To, me, right, to me, if you're, if you're, if any of you are trying to get in on a fundamental play, right, you're in on a fundamental play, but you are ignoring the signs from the charts. That means, that means you just believe that there's going to be that, that burst. Okay, it will make a lot more sense to buy a call option that is in the money. Yes, it may cost you a little bit more, all right, but it may make a lot more sense to buy that call option that is in the money. Yeah, all right, but you know, I, I, I leave it to you. So for me, even if I'm going to go in, right, I'll just have to wait for a better positioning. Because I mean, that's how, that's how I've been built. And, and after trading for so many years, I rather miss a trade. I rather miss a trade than to get in on a bad one. And I think any of you who are in the community long enough, right, you will know this about me. All right, I'd rather miss a trade, right, than to really get in on a bad one. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, for me today, I don't have, I don't have a thing. I like the <laughs> fundamentals. I like the fundamentals of the company. I think that it's pointing out, right. But there are a few things that is going against me pulling a decision. One, uh, what I see on the charts, all right, and two, the bid and ask of the options. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, right? yes. 
shows a little bit of a lack of a liquidity. Yes, it does. So actually, because of that, right, I was going to put you on a spot, but you mentioned a bit of us. Then, um, mm. because uh, if we were to take the in the money call options, right, then yes, like you shared, it, it's actually uh, going to be in a way more ideal because there's going to be less time decay. Uh, I actually took the out of money because I look at it and the you know offer spread seems to be more ideal, and uh, okay, the amount of sleepage seems to be less. Let me ask you this question: then. Do you have an uh, upside huh. potential target? Say again, sorry. Do you have an upside potential target on the stock? I don't. I you I'm just gonna hold was... until maximum. Okay. Uh, then then you know by all means then then you should uh buy a twenty dollar call yeah because there are ways there are ways to circumvent the expiry and what if it doesn't uh what if it doesn't uh go in your favor as you get closer and closer to expiry yeah okay uh. I think maybe I think maybe this will be a good thing that I can share with uh, our community over here. All right, now so uh, if you if you want to know how you can do trade management, all right, uh, join us join us in tomorrow's session. I will run a poll, all right, in our community session, and if it is favorable enough, I may actually do a coaching session on it. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Eric, shall we move into the Q and A? Yes, we should. All right now so okay, anybody come. with any yeah anybody with questions on uh the stock itself today that we brought up and uh possibly anything about the options or you know the uh technical outlook of the stock that we mentioned as well so far all right throw it out uh, time to throw it out sure maybe we just start from the start when the session just started we do have one all right here uh this one i can pick here now, a uh, question is asking on what circumstances will we be asked to provide more funds like uh, highlighted? Because what happened is that recently, Interactive Brokers actually requested uh, traders or account holders who are trading, trading purely on margins to put up more cash. A uh, question is asking, uh, when will brokers do that? If I could recall, as you train us when we started the session, when we started our very first trading journey, is that you told us anytime they feel like it, they can do so. Yeah, they yes. have the right to do that. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So, yeah. So, uh, because of that, right, the management of your 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 deposits, how much are you using your utilization of accounts, utmost essential. In fact, it should be the number one thing you always focus on as you are aspiring to be a better trader. Yes. Yeah. And you must also understand that uh, these kind of deposit or you know margin margin increase uh, requirements, right, will only work for unprotected uh, trades. That means if you are an option seller, right, and then you are selling uh, options, you're selling options uh, that is unprotected. For example, naked call or naked put. Then what's required is the brokers will require a margin from you, right? So what they are effectively telling you is when you are taking unprotected trade positions, they are going to demand more protection on your trade. That's what they're trying to tell you right now. Okay, and it's not it's not new. They have done this before. Anytime a particular stock's volatility shoots up. Right, they have every right to demand more from you, because whatever they start off is a guideline, right? Just like the banks, the banks have every right to call your loan on you, right? And that's exactly what they're doing, right? So they're giving you a warning shot. They're telling you that there's potentially more volatility, right? So you better make sure that you do not overtrade, right? And you stay liquid, right? Because if you do overtrade, right, and you know the markets go against you. I have every right to call call out on you, right? You must understand when you play a margin game, when you play a leverage game, that's always the risk, right? If you assume that everything is going to work out in your favor and you leverage to the hilt, okay, then yes, that's always going to be a detriment to you, right? No insurance companies run like that. Trust me, you are an option seller. You are operating an insurance business, right? Effectively the same, right? So don't do what they don't do. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I think that's just all to say. Yeah. Okay, but if you're doing defined risk, that means your risks are controlled, your risks are fixed, there's a maximum loss to you know your your trades and strategies, then this doesn't apply to you at all. Yeah, okay, all right. So I guess our viewers are gonna be very going very easy on us today. There's no question on my Chinese reader. It's more on the questions there's on two, the there's only two, two, two reasons, Jeremy. One. Uh, they really don't have questions. Two. Oh, they I love them. 
They don't like the stock. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like the pick today. <laughs> Man. Uh, but no problems. You know, there are always going to be stocks that will be liked. There will be stocks that will not be liked. And I think, I think maybe, Jeremy, at this point of time, at this point of time, maybe we should try this. Okay, let's try this for next week. How about this, Jeremy? Are you up for it? Eh, uh, sure. Let me know. Okay. Now, so if any of you, okay, because I know some of you have been joining us religiously week after week. We thank you very much for your support. Okay. Now, so at, at this point of time, right, if, if you have a particular stock, you have a particular stock that you have been thinking, you have been trying to get a deeper analysis into it. Okay. All right. Now, here's what I want you to do. Okay. I want you to leave a comment. Okay. I want you to leave a comment in today's video. Okay, all right. You, you can even do it. You can do it after the session has ended because Jeremy and myself will go and look at the comments. Okay, uh, leave a comment on the stock. Okay, on the stock that you want an analysis of. All right, and also, and also, don't just give us a stock name. Right, give us the stock and tell us, tell us where your difficulty lies. That means you know there's an obvious reason why you're looking at the stock, right? But you know you may want another objective. So tell us where is your problem. Okay, and then, you know, Jeremy and myself will pick uh, the one stock that we think is very, very attractive and, and we will discuss it. Because like we said many times, these sessions are meant to benefit you. Yeah, okay, so, you know, in sessions like today, right, if you don't have questions for us, it makes us feel like maybe it was not beneficial to you. <laughs> yeah, 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 right? I mean, it, it just makes us feel that way. Yes, you know, it may be beneficial, but if you don't tell us, we won't know. Yeah, so we can only take a gauge from your response in the comment section and of course your response by helping us share out the videos right because you know we do see that certain stocks do get more shares as compared to the others all right so you know you have to let us know because we are doing this for you as well yeah all right now so jeremy we're up for it right so all of you have the license to post any stock that you've been looking at for a deeper analysis okay jeremy will do the fundamental part i will do the strategic part Okay, that means the option strategies part as well as the market timing part. Yeah, for in our let's, next. Uh, let's yes. put a let's put a limiter at least. U.S. market, U.S. market. Ah uh, yeah 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> because not U.S. Then I got no no strategy to discuss also. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, just go back to YC over here. Yes, portfolio trades. Uh, I've mentioned this. I think you're asking in perspective to portfolio building with Terrence, all right? And I've said it many, 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 many times again. This is a different segment altogether, all right? Now, and I should not be discussing here as well, all right? But all the trade. Okay, I'm ready to own the stock. Okay, so in this instance over here, all right, all the trades are done on full cash. Okay, that means they are uh, cash secured puts. They are not just naked puts, but they are cash secured puts. Yeah, all right, cash secured puts. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, options and futures. Okay, now I will cover that in next week. Okay, because we are a little bit over today. All right, I'll cover that in next week's section over here. And I will just highlight, I'll highlight the plus and minuses when it comes to options uh, on futures. Okay, now uh, I will always say this irregardless of what people have told you, irregardless of what people have said to you so far, right? If you think of options, okay? You need to think of uh, stock options as primary school level. Stock options is primary school level. Once you go into futures options, it's secondary to JC levels. Yeah, okay? So if you have not passed your PSLE, please don't jump the next step. <laughs> yeah, okay? I, I still believe it's natural progression. Yes, the potential looks much bigger there. The potential looks much bigger there. But, you know, with bigger profits also comes bigger risk. So the unfortunate thing is a lot of people are not aware of the bigger risk part. Yeah, okay? Because I can tell you this from personal uh, experiences as well. I may have done very, very well when it comes to stock options, right? Have I delved into options on futures as well? Yes, I have, right? Have I suffered from debt as well? Yes, I have. <laughs> yeah, okay, all right now. So, you know, from, from a debt perspective, I can just say this. Trading options of futures becomes very much like a short-term trader, like a day trader. You know, you have to constantly be on top of your positions. Yeah, okay, and you have to constantly make decisions when they go right for you, when they go wrong for you. If you're not prepared for that, then, you know, it, it makes a lot more sense to stick with uh, stock, stock options of it. 
Okay, now, but I promise I'll be spending some time to discuss on that. All right, now, so I think that brings us to the close for today's session, Jeremy. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time once again on the weekends. Okay, and uh, if, any of you would like, if any of you would like us to cover a stock that you have in your mind that you are, you know, a little bit stuck on over here in our next uh, week section, right? Next week will be dedicated to all of you. Yeah, okay, name us your stock. Give us your stock. Okay, let us know. Okay, we'll do a deep analysis into it from fundamentals, all right, to option strategies on what you can possibly do. Okay, so I promise you this, I'm not covering just one. Any strategy that I did in Project Options cash flow, okay, if there is a trade, okay, I will I'll bring it out. I'll bring it out into the picture. Okay, so having said that, those of you who have not gone through Project Options cash flow, or if you are not in our community yet, okay, please go to our website, okay, our website, www.impossibleinvestors.com. Okay, look for Project Options Cash Flow and put yourself on the list. Okay, you will be sent a series of option strategies, right, over a period of entire 30 days. So think of it like a free mini options e-course on different option strategies that you can apply out there. Yeah, all right. Now, so uh, we have officially come to a close as well. So just before I do end over here, I just want to do a short little shout out. Okay, a short little shout out. Let me find the... Right post over here. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Yes. All right. Okay. Now, so some of you have been sending us emails. All right. Okay. But if you have not, okay, and you are interested on some of our upcoming option selling mentorships, right? We have one that is uh, near approaching, right? We have one upcoming that it's going to happen on 10 of October, right? So 10 of October, we have one session coming up. So send us an email if you're interested to find out more on how you can kickstart your professional journey as an option seller and build a portfolio being an option seller together with myself, together with Jeremy. He's one of the coaches and mentors uh, in the program itself as well. So send us an email. Yeah, all right. We do have a couple of slots left. Yeah. All right. Now, thank you very much for joining us again for another week. Jeremy and myself will sign off over here and we will look forward to catching all of you next week again. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Enjoy your Sunday. Thank you, Byron. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.